Good morning. Good afternoon, AO National. Uh, my name is Josh Spence, one of the MGAs in the office here today. Wonderful to see you guys all here with us today on our uh, Tuesday top producer training. So uh, just a couple of things. First of all, if you guys are already in here, make sure you guys do all of your videos on, please, just because uh, that way you, know you guys are listening, of course, and uh, definitely grab a pen and piece of paper so you can make some notes uh, throughout. And uh, we're just going to be going over a few things. Uh, first and foremost, just to do with uh, what I'm going to be covering today is going to be more so um, around objection handling, and as well as just, uh, you know, really um, how to build a proper program and how to go through that and really get the paint the picture for your client. So at the end, when you're getting yeses all the way throughout your presentation, there's no reason why at the end, your client, uh, regardless of the price, isn't going to well, you know want to move forward with the program that you've shown them. So uh, and throughout this, uh, at the end, we'll also end with the Q&A so that you guys can ask any questions that you may have as well. So and throughout, if you do post them in the chat, it does work too. That way at the end, I can look at those or just uh, at the end, I'll just open it up for a Q&A for the last 10 or 15 minutes and we can uh, cover anything else that anyone may have for questions from there. So first and foremost, guys, I know that uh, you know a lot of times in sales in general, it can be a little nerve wracking. Like even right now myself, I'm a little bit nervous in general. So a couple of things, just tips for you guys in general. So a couple of things that I do as well, if I'm ever nervous going into a set uh, or just anything at all, uh, like a training call, like any sales call, anything at all. So it's going in front of the mirror and really just, uh, you know, saying something, some, some positive affirmations to yourself to make yourself feel, you know, confident in your own skin, as well as, you know, looking at yourself and just, you know, positive affirmations, really just build yourself up. And it's about being confident, not cocky, of course, but being confident in your abilities, as well as, you know, with just uh, like with what you do as well and, you know, who you are as a person. So that really is important. I do find, um, you know, especially as well, uh, with us being on virtual there too. So there's another factor that we really don't get to have that same in-person communication and those same build of, um, you know, a, like rapport and emotion that we would have otherwise. So really being able to do it on Zoom and knowing how to do it on Zoom is super important. So um, whether it be like what you're leaning into the camera, or leaning back, all those different non-verbal communication, uh, you know, that's super, super crucial in a presentation. Um, but I'll just cover a few things with you guys here, just kind of going through more so the second half of our of our presentation after you've already gotten your referrals and your no cost benefits, how to really build that, uh, you know, paint that picture for your client and how to identify a lot of times what the, what the objection is. Is it logistics or is it a fear-based objection? And then from there, you'll then be able to know what to then do, whether it's down close or handle the objections and how to properly do that, Okay. So yeah, make sure you guys do have all pens and papers uh, up there so you guys can make notes, of course, and come back to some of these things. Because I know that uh, for myself, when I was in my first year, two years, you know, these training calls like this were really what did help me getting bits and pieces from everybody that was doing well in the business and really putting that into, you know, what, what, what my, my process was really is what worked for me. Uh, if I couldn't have done it on my own, 100%. So definitely takes whatever you can from what I do over with you guys today and implement it right away. Um, that way you can definitely start to, you know, hopefully see some results from that as well too. Uh, and not be leaving your appointments, you know, feeling like there's money on the table or that you could have done better or you should have closed them. That really shouldn't be happening. So hopefully we can cover some things here in this meeting that's really going to, you know, get your clients actively listening to you in your sits as well. And also, you know, when you're getting those objections, you're going to know how to handle them as well. You should only be really coming across. There's only so many objections you can get in a meeting, right? And after you've gotten, you know, a few different types of objections, then you, like every, after a year or two years, you really can't get anything really new for the most part. It's going to be a variation of some other objection you've handled before, and you'll know how to handle them all after a certain point in time, really. Um, that's kind of how I do feel that sometimes. And there's times where I get into momentum. We are in a momentum-based business as well. So once you do, once you do get past a set and you've handled like, you know, five rounds of objections at the end, you don't want to just fold and go over to, you know, and just fold and, you know, go on to the next member and do the report card. It's not about being pushy guys. It's about really trying to do your job. And if you know that, that a need is there, then your job is to, of course, fill that need. Uh, so in insurance, nobody wants to, you know, uh, be adding extra bills as you want to call it, but I wouldn't call life insurance a bill whatsoever. And I would always clarify that with my client as well. If they ever mention the word bill, and I'm talking about at the end after my close question, which I'll get to that too, when we get to the end, but uh, they really shouldn't feel like they're adding a bill on. If anything, they, they like the cost should not uh, even really matter because the, what you're showing them, the cost is the last thing you want to do go over. And so just not showing your cards too early as well. So I'll kind of go over my whole process with you guys of what I do throughout the, my second half and the transitions as well. Because the transition is probably one of the most important parts uh, in your in, in your second half 
So um, like regardless of the, of the lead type, especially for McGruff's and Wilkits, that transition is super important um, because you definitely need to identify where the end of the no cost benefits are. And that now we're going to be going into the permanent program and asking to have any questions so far. That's in our script, just like you guys could all see in your scripts there as well on your sides. You'll all have that part in there where they where it does ask now. Uh, so that's it for all your no cost messaging questions so far. And then you answer any questions they have thus far. Usually they'll say to you, no, pretty straightforward. I think you explained it pretty well. And I think it's almost done, but no, now we're just getting into the permanent program, um, of course. And then at that point, really, the Labor Advisory Board is your biggest tool for credibility um, when it comes to you know the company's credibility, you as an agent as well, too. Um, so really showing that Labor Advisory Board as well and really actually honing in on it. And I try and make the conversations or make the presentation and also comes down to your script. So know your script as well, too. That's also another really, really big thing. If you don't know your script well enough yet, you're still pretty new. Uh, and you're just starting here, then like I would suggest printing your scripts off and every night reading those scripts. Even to this day, if I haven't done a sit and let's say, or I've done just like one or two sits in the last couple of days, I might start doing it in the, like while I'm in the shower, I'll start saying my script to myself, or I'll start just, you know, like while I'm walking around the house or driving, whatever it may be, I'll start reciting script. And, and if I don't know it, then of course I need to go back to my script and read it a few times again, and make sure I got the rest off of me and I know what I'm saying in front of my clients. So I can focus on not just what I'm saying, but how I'm saying it, right? Because how you say things is really what the important part is. And then, so getting those words right, of course, are super important. They're all there for us. We all use the same exact scripts. Nobody really adds and changes things too much there. If they are, it's not going to work in every single home. What you might say in one home that's different, it's not going to work in every single home, but our script will work in every single home. So that's why you do want to follow it. And if you don't yet know it and you can't really recite certain parts of uh, the script off the top of your head, then I would highly suggest that you take the time to do that and get good at it because, you know, this is a craft. You want to get good at your craft, you know, like as working in sales, that's what you do want to do. And of course you want to make more sales, right? So how do you do that? You really have to, of course, memorize things and you have to, that's going to be one of them as a script and know your products as well too. And so spending time on the arc as well is super important. I spent hours and hours in the actuarial on the arc, looking things up just to understand the products better myself. Um, but this all will come later on. So if you're still brand new, don't worry about having to know everything right off the bat. You'll actually learn as you go. So don't worry about having to like figure it all out beforehand. That's a misconception that a lot of people do have. You'll figure it out with the clients you're with by having to get an answer for a client and answering them honestly that you're not too sure that you can double check. And then of course, by either calling your manager in that meeting right then and there for them if they needed it right then, or getting the answer for them afterwards, either or, uh, is, 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 is really how you learn those things, right? And how you then come across the information you're going to learn other stuff about, which you then can save on your computer, or you can make notes about, whatever it may be. But this is all things that you would do after field hours, guys, as well, too. So you don't want to spend your field time, you know, on the on, on the actuarial. This is when you're like, you're done your field day or before field, and you're just, or in your free time and your days off, this is what you're going to do, because of course, we're building a business here. And how do you do that? You put in time and effort and sweat equity. And so definitely uh, the script is the first and foremost thing that you want to make sure you know how to do it. Because when I give my presentations, I don't feel as though I'm actually presenting. It's like a conversation more so, um, but it's not really them talking so much. But when they do talk, you want to make sure that you do listen to them. So active listening from on both sides is important. So I find that a lot of times that I'll catch myself as well not really actively listening to what they're saying back to me. And that's when I'm not closing deals. But when I am listening to what their objections are and I'm acknowledging their objections, I'm, I'm actually figuring out, is it logistical or is it fear-based? And then rebuttaling their objection and, re and then reclosing them on it is really going to be throughout the whole presentation. And those tie downs, those yeses all throughout is super important. So if I were just to give you guys a couple of things here to start off with your transition, um, like the way you do want to go through your transition is you want to make sure, like I said, separate the no cost benefits from the second half. And that's with that question of any questions so far. That's it for all your no cost benefits, any questions so far. And that's when you then know that they now know that it's the end of the no cost benefits and you don't end up with questions at the end saying, oh, wait, this costs us money. That shouldn't happen at all. If you transfer it properly and transition properly into your second half, that truly shouldn't be happening. Um, but now next, when you do go into your uh, labor advisory board, now HP Pro 3 is amazing, lines this all up for us. So we don't have to worry about tabs anymore, having 30 tabs open on our computer. It's all there for us. And so when I open up my labor advisory board, 
I'm going to really be excited about it, uh, not only for myself, but for them too, really. Like I want to be enthusiastic. I want to be clear. I want to be loud too. And I also am a little bit relaxed with how I do say things, but also a bit proud at the same time, because like, you know, there's over 40,000 union associations that we do work with, right? So like there are pretty big names on there. Ontario Sullivan, the president of Lyona, you know, so like there's some pretty big names on the labor advisory board and, you know, whether it's a UCW member, I'll say, oh yeah, and also your president of your unions on there as well too. Uh, and now their jobs are extremely important. What they do for us, is they help advise. And so like, really you want to get active listening going because people will just go through a presentation and not actually really listen to what you're saying. They're just going to be saying yes all the way throughout. You can catch some with that as well too, which I can explain how to do that too. Uh, and find people that aren't actually listening to you. But you do want to stop if at any point in time in the second half of your meeting that you find that both, uh, uh, you know, both the couple, uh, or sorry, the member and their spouse aren't actually, you know, paying attention the best they possibly could be, or like, you know, actually giving you attention they do need. If you aren't in a good buying situation, then it's best to move that appointment to a different time. Like if I see there's kids running around behind them and it's just not a good situation for them to be making like choices or thinking about these kind of things at that time, I'm going to move the appointment. And I do that all the time because I don't want to sit with somebody and waste their time or my time and not really have them listening to me either, right? Like someone's cooking dinner uh, while they're doing the meeting. It's not really a good situation to be going through a presentation. Yes, you could close them, but is it going to be really understood properly? Likely not. So you want to make sure you're at a good buying situation. That's why scheduling your appointments at proper times is really important as well too. So if you have people that have children, you want to be meeting with them in the evenings likely. So when the kids are gone to bed, that way they can actually sit down with you and they're not distracted by other things. It's not during dinner time. It's not like right after work, you know, like give them time to get home first from work if it is after work um, or better yet on their days off is really the best time or evenings. Like I said, usually most of my sales do come between 6.30 and 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, typically. Not much before that usually. Um, and if it is, those are the retirees or people that just happen to have their day off that day that I'm sitting with. So uh, having good buying situations is really important. So now when you are going through and just keep in mind that sales is a transfer of emotions as well too. So when you're feeling a certain way, they're going to feel the same way as well too, right? So you have to go into your meeting and really make sure that you're demonstrating yourself as not only the expert here, but also that you're in control. And there's ways to do that throughout your presentation. And the first one is going to be your tonality. So practice this, a good tip would be doing video off presentations. That way you can really focus on your script and what you're saying, how you're saying it, and then go into the nonverbal communication and you can implement that afterwards is what I would suggest to do. So if you find yourself not really able to properly convey a message but to your clients, uh, you know, the best when your video on, if you get a little bit anxious and try video off for a few meetings, I've done it before many, many times, and it really does work well. I can tell you that there's not much difference at all, if anything, to actually pay attention more if than otherwise, because you're able to actually speak louder, you're able to speak clearer, and also the objections are a little bit fewer than what they would be until the very end. Then you handle them all at the very end, as opposed to being cut off throughout your meeting, which, and then you're being, you know, thrown off as well, too. You want to really be able to just have, have good flow throughout your meeting and presentation and not having interruptions throughout and, you know, them being distracted as well, too, like I said, is also one thing you want to make sure to avoid. And yes, it's not, it's not always going to be perfect, guys. It's just, this is the way it is. But of course, we do have some control over these things. And being the person that is in control of the meeting and the direction it's going, you know, like, for example, if I see somebody that's sitting on the floor with their spouse and then the, and the members are actually up on the table sitting down, like one's down here, one's up here. I'm going to ask them to both sit side by side, you know, like, and it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask them that I'm not, like, I don't feel bad about doing it um, because I know that otherwise at the very end of that meeting, the wife's going to want to talk to the husband about it because they weren't both watching at the same time. Right. So you'll make sure they're both looking at you. The active eye contact as well, too, is super, super important. And the labor advisory board is going to help, um, you know, avoid those objections about, you know, who are you like, like, where are you from the company's credibility as well, too. It's all right there in the labor advisory board as well as our script. But then when you're going through your preliminary questions, so there are people that think that they don't need life insurance yet, for example, or this is just a bad time for us, those kinds of things like that as well, too. So in our script, there's a line, um, there's actually a line that goes through once you've actually finished filling out your needs analysis, but premature to that, though, is, is of course, your prelim questions. So your prelim questions are going to be really where you can actually do some takeaways a little bit 
uh, you know, or kind of plant seeds that they may not be able to get it. Like, so, and that's really where you want to be able to do that properly. So there's questions that I've heard on master's classes as well, where they've added in different questions. I wouldn't say to add in other questions, but I would just say to really like ask very like broadly. So, uh, so for example, health, health issues in your lifetime, I ask about for them and family history as well too, because family history is going to, of course, I'll make notes and I'll just plant it in their head. Like, you know, that, that can have an effect, not right on their insurability, but on their health and their ability to get insurance down the road. Yes. So, I mean, it's not uh, like, I'm not saying what the actual reasoning is behind them, like why I'm asking about family history, but I'm also going to ask about that as well too my health issues in your lifetime. And of course, uh, medications, I don't get into too much of the specifics when it comes to medications. You want to ask yes or no. You don't want to get too invasive. I've seen, and I've also had it happen to me as well too, where I've asked for the medications they're taking in the preliminary questions and been shut down directly, like right then and there. And that was when I was newer. And of course I stopped doing that and don't ever do that again. And I wouldn't uh, suggest it to anybody else either. So it's yes or no questions to that. If the answers to the health issues is a yes, and you have to then look at your underwriting field guide to know if you can even go any further. At that point, yes, some medications they cannot be taking. For example, a cancer medication that they might take after they're finished cancer treatments, that can affect things, of course. So you would want to ask them if they are on that because there's medications that would cause somebody to be uninsurable or to be auto decline. But other than that, though, generally speaking, for medications, I'm not going to be asking what the actual meds are. Um, and I just want to make sure I just get like a gist of their health and any health issues. Yes, I'll be specific and I will ask them. So like, and they'll usually tell me right away, but you want to make sure that you're not getting objections at this point in time. And if you are um, at the end, we can definitely role play that there in, in the Q&A at the end when we do go over that. But you want to make sure that you're just like actually making them feel like, hey, well, based on what you told me there, Chris, I'm not sure if you would be able to qualify, but you do have a chance. So I can at least go ahead and explain the program to you. What they have me do now is what's actually called your needs analysis. So now the needs analysis determines what your specific needs are based on three different things. Okay. So I'm using my hands, guys. I'm using my, like, not just my mouth, I'm using my hands as well, too. I'm giving eye contact throughout it. And I'm going to go through those three reasons. And I go ahead and ask them the other questions, see if they might be able to try and qualify for. At that point, I'm then going to be filling in their needs analysis, most definitely. Now, this is a part where this, this the program needs to be felt like it's customized and tailored to them as well, too. Um, if it's not felt like that, they're going to feel like it doesn't apply to them or they already are they already are covered, they're good to go, where you can really identify, you know, usually if you haven't already in your estate information section, which is a really important part of your presentation script as well, too, but in your second half, most importantly, identifying, you know, with them that like they don't have these certain types of coverage they should already have is really important. So, uh, for example, if somebody has term insurance on their mortgage, side of the bank and they are saying that they have life insurance and I'll say to them, so that's, so that's for their mortgage though, right? All right. So the no whole life yet, correct? Uh, and I'll actually get that them to say to me, yes, no whole life yet. Like I'm just going to put down zeros, the, them actually telling me that, yes, it's a zero for the whole life section or for term life, whichever it may be, or for any of them. And for work insurance, be very assumptive. No one's going to usually, most members don't know what they have for insurance through work. So by actually knowing yourself, being the expert in the room, it's going to identify you as the expert. If I can tell, for example, a teacher that in Ontario, that yes, it's three years of your salary, because so I do know that that's usually what it is since they opted for additional, then I can put down three years of their salary. Um, now, for most members, in a lot of cases, I know what Lyuna has, I know what most of them have, but I mean, you want to be able to know these things to then be able to then say to them, yes, yeah, so usually for your local and your members and your union in particular, usually it's amount or two down your salary or one year salary or this round number, whatever it may be for that union or group, or even just that occupation in general. Um, and at that point, then really putting that number in there and not just actually just guessing or having them not know, and then then feel like the program you're going to be showing them isn't actually appropriate for them. So you want to be, be able to know that, you know, in most cases, guys, your, your, your fail safe can be one year salary. All right. Unless they opted for additional. Now, if they're in a good paying position and it's they have good, you know, if it's a good union as well, too. But if, if, it's, if, it, if it's a referral, for example, and you aren't sure what the heck that, uh, you know, certain sector covers their members for or covers their employees for, I would probably aim for probably two years salary just to be safe and be, you know, be conservative on that side of things and do put down two years salary just to be safe. Um, but otherwise, because they're not going to usually know their work insurance off the top of their head. And then they're outside of work insurance, like I said. You want to be able to actually get them to tell you that, no, they have no whole life yet. 
and uh, and then actually getting that from them that yes is super important. And then when you are going through your program, building a proper program, of course, but explaining our power first and foremost actually is going to be more important than anything else. So explaining our power and getting the understanding of it is super, super important. So when I'm explaining our power as well, if a client doesn't seem to understand it, and I ask them the question about the one twentieth of your income change your lifestyle, any, I'll even add something in there to help them understand that part. Of course, like for example, if your job, if your boss said you can leave work two hours early, you're not going to be struggling to pay your bills, and vice versa, if you say two hours late, correct? And they're going to usually say, yeah, no, no, like not at all, exactly, yeah. And then you then go with your script from there. But actually getting them to understand that that's two hours a week, not a month, two hours per week. And that's compared to what a normal advisor would tell you to do, which our script all has in there, which is, of course, 10 to 15% of your income and using that for your pandemic protection. Whereas the union's programs are based on your two hours, which is only 5%, that way all the members can actually afford it. And then explaining to them what they are allowed to set aside and showing the proper program. So if somebody makes $70 an hour, for example, or 50 bucks an hour, for example, I'm going to show them that $100 a week, right? That's what I'm going to do. And then the, I'll also count in their monthly expenses per month, which is on our HP Pro 3 needs analysis now. So I'll definitely, so it's, it shows them that I'm being cognizant to what they have in their lives going on situational because everybody has situations different, right? So somebody might make, you know, $100,000 a year, but also have a lot of debt and those expenses could be really high. And some others might make less of an income, but have a lot less expenses and have also more of an ability to actually afford these kinds of things. So it shows that you're actually being, you know, customized to their, their actual situation, right? So uh, making sure that you're actually just acknowledging them throughout it, using those nonverbal communication skills. But uh, when it really does come to the important times is when you're going through the areas of concern. So when you're going through areas of concern, you always want to add in hospital coverages at all times and use hospital triple for everything. So the 300, so the 150, 300, and 600, if not even higher. If they're like a union member that does a risky job, I'll go to quadruple at that point, especially if they're young. Now, if they're a senior, then you still want to add hospital in. Even if they're, you know, even if it's a retiree program at $20 a week, you still want to make sure that you're giving them hospital because it's going to add a lot of more value for retention purposes as well as just showing that proper actual program, not just one type of coverage, because just like you guys have probably heard, who would want to get rid of their hospital coverage and their funeral coverage and their accidental and their income protection? It's going to be, you know, that's going to be few and far between. Um, but if it's just one product, and then at that point, it's a lot easier just to get rid of that, right? So that's why you always want to add hospital, but getting the tie downs on there and using their names. People love to hear their names. It's their favorite word. I can promise you that. So if you tell, if you were to use their name throughout it as many times as possible, like I try to implement it in every single line, if not every other line to try and say their name in the presentation. So by the end of the, that certain sentence, they're listening to me quite attentively. I can get the tie down and I can get the yes on that. And really it's a yes. And they'll even elaborate usually. Yeah, that actually helped out quite a bit. Like, you know, usually, yeah. Or the answer to the question of, you know, actually me creating a problem. You actually do want to follow the script, but the thing is, it's all there for us. We all say the exact same words. I don't say any different than you guys do, but all it's the exact same words that you guys are saying in your scripts as well, too, in your meetings, too. It's just how I'm saying it, I guess, is maybe what the difference is uh, compared to somebody that was, I was brand new. It, I know for sure it was how I was saying it. I wasn't saying it with, you know, with any sort of conviction, any passion as well, too. So when you have that passion in your voice and you are sure of what you're saying, and you're not like, you know, uncertain. Am I showing something that, that you know, like, like they actually need this? Yes, they do need it. And most of them do need these things. It doesn't matter if they have a prepaid funeral, they have whole life and term life already. I mean, most members do have 10 times their annual income and insurance already. So that's none. So that's, 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 that doesn't really matter at all, guys. You want to make sure to take your prejudgments and leave them at the door because I always prejudged clients in the beginning and it very, very did, it very much did hurt me for my results. I can tell you that um, because I would always fold and go to the report card after one round of objections when a lot of those clients were very much closable had I just figured out what the objection was actually about. You can't always just, uh, you know, think that it's going to be affordability. So when I'm going through a medium, and I'm going through, especially that second area of concern and the Freedom of Choice Certificate, that's really the one that really does get most people and realize, and they do realize that they're not going to be in the situation that they thought they'd be in, right? So most people don't realize how life insurance does pay out. 
and the fact that it's not going to pay out immediately. They could have whole life, term life, you know, rest of life in the works, and it's still not going to help them when, when a state probate has their bank accounts locked and they can't access those and the insurance proceeds haven't paid out yet. Do they want their family filing insurance claim forms on the phone with the bank while they, while they, while they should be grieving, right? Uh, that can come afterwards, which is what our products do. They fill that gap, of course, for anybody. It doesn't matter what they have. And at that point, the family can actually grieve properly and then get the other insurance policies paid out afterwards, if there are any in that case anyways. But either way, the freedom of choice is really where you, it's when really where you're building that, like at the, in that area right there, they should be thinking to themselves after you've explained what exactly our script has word for word in it, guys. Uh, at the end of that, they should really feel like, okay, I really don't know. This is, and they're going to be really thinking about that person that they name, that who's, who take care of their expenses on behalf of them. It's going to be their son or their spouse. You know, they're going to be thinking about that if it's explained properly. And you really want to just tone down your voice as well in certain parts of your script, but then also tone it up in other parts. So, for example, when I'm showing a problem, I'm going to speak a little bit or explaining a problem. I'm going to be, you know, a little bit softer spoken. But then when I'm showing the solution, that's when I'm going to be a bit more excited and a bit more passionate because, hey, look, well, hey, they have this for you. And then I'm going to be a bit more passionate about it. And which would be also come across in my vocals. I'll be a bit louder, a lot of more um, uh, as well as just, you know, tonality going up and down as well in my voice too. But the tie downs after those. And if you're, getting, if you're, if you're saying nods, Nods are not yeses. You want to get a yes after all your tie downs. And if you don't get that yes, don't move forward. So if I'm explaining the freedom of choice and I ask the tie down after that question about it being awesome to have it taken care of now for their family, if they don't say yes to me on that one, if they just nod their heads, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to get a, sorry, what was that? And I'm going to actually ask them to repeat themselves and say, yes, it is. Yeah. And if they say, yeah, then I don't know what they're saying yeah to. So I'm going to literally ask them again. Don't be afraid to say it twice, guys. You want to make sure you get yeses on all your tie downs before you move forward. Because otherwise, if there is an objection there, you want to be able to know how to handle that objection. Uh, and if it needs to be handled then or afterwards, most objections that you'll get can be handled at the end of your presentation after the closed question has been asked. And once that's been asked, that's when you can handle all their objections but if they do ask you one throughout it, or if it's a question, you definitely want to acknowledge it, guys. So I find that I've seen this, I've done it myself too, and I've kind of skipped over what a client has told me as being a problem or, or being a question. And I've skipped over it and told them that it would be answered throughout. And if I'm already almost done the meeting anyways, if I'm in like area three and a question comes up or, you know, like, well, won't this, you know, not work if I already have this in place, you want to be able to answer their questions, acknowledge their objection, and make them understand that like you are actually in their shoes and like, like you're putting yourself in their shoes more or less at that time by like by your acknowledgement and how you acknowledge their objection and you want to rebuttal it. So by rebuttaling it, that's just explaining the reason why you're showing them that even though they already have OHIP, they already have, of course, their uh, disability insurance through work, why we're showing hospital benefits. You want to acknowledge that and rebuttal it with why. And of course, the reason being is because the concern isn't about your medical expenses, lost wages and other bills that are adding up over time. And then all I can say to them, so like if you were to, you know, cut your finger in the fridge right now, like, you know, cooking dinner, if you were to the hospital, would they pay you for going to the hospital? And if the answer is no, then of course, I've then handled that objection. I can then move forward because they realize that, okay, this is what this is for them. It doesn't matter if it happens at work or not, or I may have to just re-explain it all over again, which is fine as well too. So there's never uh, a bad thing with having, with having to re-explain things to a client if they do ask, right? But you want to be clear enough in the beginning of it and getting those tie downs and not just getting the nods, but getting the yeses throughout, which will lead you to the bigger yes at the very end, right? And so if you're not showing two hours as well, that's a big thing that you should be doing. Show two hours. It doesn't matter if it's over the ALP limit for a standard submit or not. Show them the two hours. And then once you get the yes on it, then of course, adjust as necessary. So... What you're going to want to do, though, is after you've then went through and painted that picture and made them feel like, you know, like make them really understand that someone's going to be dealing with this. It's going to be the family. It's going to be their children. Or it could be, you know, somebody in the family that doesn't even talk to any longer. If somebody who hasn't have a big family or isn't very, isn't very close to them, they could really be in a situation that's not a good one. And also people will also give you objections about, for example, that they have money in the bank to take care of those things. Well, I mean, this is $80,000 in your bank today. 
as opposed to, you know, so you have this in the bank right now, they're going to probably say no to you. And if they do, that should be spent for your family's legacy money. That, that should be spent, you know, like for you guys for retirement, et cetera. That shouldn't be used for this. Insurance is what you should use this for. It would cost you less money in the end, or you can pay dollar for dollar if you decide to, which of course would cost you more money in the end, right? So those are objections that you might come across, but a state probate locks all that up. Right. So in most cases, anyways, if it's if it doesn't, it's going to be a roll of the dice if it does, because if they are married, that can be a good thing, because that means that the other spouse will still have access to funds. But the late spouse is then going to be in a spot where they don't have insurance in place for their final expenses, then they're not going to be able to their family isn't going to be able to go access their money in the bank necessarily. Uh, they might, but necessarily, maybe not without penalty anyways. So you want to be sure that you're really being clear on a state probate as well, too, and knowing what that is. If you don't, just do some research on it to figure out how it does work and you know what actually causes it to happen and why those, those, those funds in the bank aren't going to be necessarily usable for your family to take care of these things. And they shouldn't be, even if they are accessible, they shouldn't be used for this. The idea is that you spend less, save yourself money and your family money in the long run, also for convenience as well too. So there's no one else that sells policies or that offers products like Freedom of Choice than we do. And that's, I can tell you, is that one with certainty? There's really a couple of companies that will give similar things, but they're the ones that are investing the, those things into other policies. And it's like particular funeral homes, or it's just guaranteed issue policies, which aren't underwritten, those kind of things as well too, that aren't going to necessarily pay out. Um, so you want to make sure that you are like, like what you guys are actually showing people is uh, our products that are going to pay out that are going to work so you guys can get passionate about it. There's times where I'll go 10, 12 rounds of objections with a client because I'm passionate about what I'm showing them and that they do need it. I know they need it. And if I know they need it, I'm not going to stop until I, you know, until they run out of objections more or less. And you know, that's not really say to me, except for yes, Josh, we'll go with the basic program for now, really at that point. So, um, but going throughout it all, you want to make sure, like I said, that you're really building value and adjusting things for them. So, and if I know that someone's program is going to be a ridiculously high, you know, because their hourly wage, then I'm going to make sure I have plan option two set in HP uh, Pro 3. So the plan option two, as you guys know, we have the ability to, of course, uh, add in plan options now. Uh, so after the close questions asked, it'll show you the other plan options. Don't add, don't add more than two. Um, so two, more than two is too many options. So, um, but you, let's say, for example, their two hours is $550 a month. I'm going to show them as well the one hour program. I'm going to have the one hour already built and ready there for me to be able to then down close to the one hour if necessary. If I know their objections is going to be about their expenses being really high, then yes, I'm going to have that already ready. If I if I'm confident with the two hours, guys should be, then I'll just have it, you know, I'll also have it ready, but I just am not going to necessarily check it off on the screen to show it when I actually do ask the close question, because I don't want them to go with that one because this is what they do need, right? So it can be some of those things that does take time to come down to and really actually come to grips with how to handle the objections. But really just as long as you're knowing your script, guys, and that you're actually acknowledging what kind of objection you're getting, because there's different kinds of objections. So there's objections that are logistical. Logistical being like, you know, they don't know if it's in the budget. They don't know uh, if their spouse has things set up already or if their family has things set up already for them or that they don't know how it's going to work with other insurances or if they're planning on moving to a different country, for example. There's different things that come up like that. Or is it fear-based, which means that are they just afraid to make that choice of actually moving forward with insurance today and trying to qualify for a program? Now, qualifying does not mean that you're signed on the dotted line for the rest of your life. It should mean that, yes, you're doing this forever. Yes, this is what you want to have and that you do need to have. And getting the tie down. So also, if it is an affordability, so I look, in other words, not, not a fear-based objection, it's affordability, which is logistical. At that point, I'm going to then ask them that. So now, if it wasn't for the fact that it was you know a bit over your budget in that case, you guys would be going for this program though, correct? That's you know, I'm then solidifying the fact that they see the value in that program I'm showing them. And that at that point, then I'll then down close. Before I down close, I'm going to solidify what that objection really is. Like, so if they say, oh yeah, we'll go with the one hour. Then so I'll say to them, so now John and Mary, if it wasn't for the fact that the two hours was 350 a month, would you guys be going with the one hour still? Or do you guys be going with the two hours still though, right? If it wasn't for the fact that it was a bit out of your budget right now, is that what you guys are trying to say? Like I'll get that actual acknowledgement from them. And yes, that is why. Then you okay, then you down close. But if it's just like that they're just maybe you know a little bit scared about that, which could also come down to fear-based where down closing it could be necessary, but you want to know why they're giving you the objection. 
And then, like I said um, as well, same thing on the phones and in your meetings, acknowledge their objection, put yourself in their shoes, all right? And actually like use their family's names, like their, 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 their children's names as well, their siblings' names. You've gotten from the Family Information Guide earlier on. You wanna use names throughout it, especially their own. Uh, but make it seem like you understand their situation and what they already have for insurance policies or don't have and what their needs are and that you're the expert. Because if you're coming across like you're giving a presentation to somebody that it may or may not even apply to them, then how are they going to make a choice on a program at that point in time? They're going to feel like this is just isn't for them, good for some families, it's not good for our family, which is what you'll get at the very end. And if that's happening, that means that really you're not painting the picture enough for them or using their name enough throughout it and really making it more situational for them in particular and customized for them. Hence why we do meet one-on-one -on -one with each of our members instead of it being in a group setting or just all the same plans for each member. It's one-on-one -on -one meetings for that exact reason, guys. But when you do ask your close question, you do want to make sure that you're actually properly asking the close question. So I used to get a bit too wordy in my close question and it, it got me a little bit uh, in, into bad habits, I guess you could say. So I've now gotten back to just a very basic close question. And I'm telling you, people will close themselves afterwards. I figured that I, because I could handle the objections afterwards, that it wasn't a bad thing for me to ask it the way I was asking it, but really I was getting off script, right? So that's not good. And then Riley told me that, and now I'm going back through it. And I follow script verbatim on my close question and then lean back guys into close to sit back and get comfortable and really ask that question and be confident with what you're showing them with what most members do and what some members do, and then other members as well. And so now which way do you guys want to try and go? And then at that point, you just sit there and wait. Whoever talks first loses, okay? So you don't want to talk first. After that question's asked, you want to sit there in silence and wait. And as well, if there's somebody who wants to think about it, or on Zoom, they can mute themselves. They can go and talk in another room. They can go and talk in that room right in front of you while, they're, while, while you're muted. They can figure it out, whatever it is out on their own there. There shouldn't be too many follow-up meetings that you should be booking. Um, and as long as you get in the yeses throughout and you can get that big yes at the end, and it shouldn't really have a, it shouldn't really have a, um, like a time where you're, you're getting people that are going to want to think about it or just, you know, this isn't a, this is a bad time, you know, cause our script has parts in it where it says there's like any other enrollment period provided that you can qualify, which we don't know yet. There are questions I have to ask you that we can't do later or over the phone. And that whole line right there, that line is what you don't want to bring back up again. All right, because bringing those lines back up, you said, said earlier on in your meeting, is going to help you justify why you're doing it the way you're doing it. And it is yes, they want your decision to be made yes or no, at least now. And then we can try and see if you can qualify, right? Um, you don't want to be uh, closing on qualifications too, too much. If you can help it, you want to close on like the need, of course. Um, but qualifications is a big thing and takeaways on that. So if somebody has health issues in their family history that I found out about in my prelim questions, that's going to come up probably if I'm handling objections that might come up and I might bring it back up again to them as well. If they're really young, feeling like they don't need it yet because they're still so young, I'm explaining to them throughout the meeting, like about the differences or even showing them that it would be at age 55 for them. If it was, if, if they did wait 30 years or, or even five years, if they did wait, what it would be for them. And also with the health, health history of their family, how is that going to be for qualifications? I've had plenty of members who I've met with who I didn't um, you know, get to that point of pulling the trigger on an application, which was my own fault because I was still learning, which is okay. They came back you know, the next year. I got them as a referral again somehow and that whole referral chain you know, came back full circle to them. And now they're an auto decline or they're you know, a trial. And just so you guys do know, anybody that we can actually write trials for, unless you're in the top 5% of Manulife, Desjardins or Sun Life, they can't write trial applications. So if somebody you're with the trial, they their options are very limited as to where to go for coverage. So we can actually write trial applications here from day one, be an agent here. So that, that actually is a pretty powerful thing to be able to say to, uh, to members as well too. So closing on qualifications in that sense can be a big thing too there as well to help you guys out with objections. But really, I know that likely objections is something that can be very different meeting to meeting. There can be a lot of questions that you guys do may have about this there, but I kind of want to open up for, for a QA and a now for you guys to see what you guys have questions for me or different problems that you guys may come across in your, um, in your presentations or objections you guys do get that you have a hard time handling. I can maybe give you guys some tips on how to handle those, like what, what I would do in a situation if it was me. So if you guys want, we can open up to a QA and a if anyone has any questions. Anybody have any questions? 
anybody have any things they can ever, ever overcome objection wise in their meetings at the end of a meeting, like the thinkers, for example, and or like distinguishing between affordability? Yeah, Sarah, sure. Okay, so I've been hitting, um, I have this great referral train and the family is wonderful. Uh, I've sold, I think there's five of them. I've sold two of them already. Uh, the one I met with on Sunday is in finance herself and her husband is way high up in, in computer software. His hourly income is a hundred, sorry, a dollar fifty, a hundred and fifty dollars an hour. Um, and when I built the program for them, they were very interested, but even though I followed the booking script, um, I guess when the refer the original sponsor spoke to them, they she explained that, oh yeah, Sarah from AI will be calling to explain all about the beneficiary part. So even though I followed the booking script, that's what they were hooked on. So when I got around to actually explaining um, the program, the contributory program, they were like, well, hang on a minute. I thought we were just talking about beneficiary. So they, they, I said, well, you know, if you're not interested, then by all means, you know, I can certainly close your file. But like I said before, this is a, a, a very exclusive offer. So I kind of went that route. And then they were very interested in the program because they'd never thought about it. They have like a $750,000 uninsured mortgage. Hello. And only one income earner. Hello. So they saw the value in the program, but they wanted to think. And I think they truly wanted to think because they're those type of people, you, like software engineer and, and a former finance controller. I, I didn't know what to do other than to let them think and book a follow-up. What would you have at that point At that point in time, so I had one like that actually not too long ago. I had a member that they didn't know if it was in their budget. Their two hours was like $400 a month. They didn't have any whole life insurance. They very much did need it. They're building a new house, all that stuff like that. So I had them do the application sign the application for the lower program and then come back on the next day to actually pick a program if they wanted to change it at that point in time. And then they said they wanted to go with one they actually did it already have built for them already, already did the app for it, it's already done. So at that point in time, I don't know if you guys even qualify yet. The company will take about six to eight weeks to think about if they'll even actually cover you guys, you know, uh, like actually finalize your policies. So with that being said, what I would suggest we do do for you is we actually get you guys can even qualify first and foremost. At that point, get the application out of the way. And then we can always can adjust numbers a lot easier. At least then that was all done out of the way right now. I think that makes sense, guys. And I would then move forward in the application from there. And then have them come back on for the report card at the end, uh, like the next day for the report card. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Anybody else? Any questions? Yeah, Kathy. I've had a lot of thinkers this month, and I don't know if it's just because it's summertime and everyone's really laid back, but, you know, when you have thinkers who are like, you know, even when you've given a one-hour option in addition to their two hours or what have you, when, um, I guess I'm just always open to other people's best practices as far as, as far as how you handle that objection, that like, I really, like, I just can't make this decision right now, even if it's someone who really, they may not have anything like this, sometimes it's like an afford capable, you know, like it's an affording issue, like, even if they're, they're looking at, like, 30 a month or 50 a month, but I just feel like I would love to hear a little bit more about how you manage that kind of, I just, I can't make this decision right now, kind of yeah, like how so you maybe now, build a bit more urgency. Maybe I just need an injection of that. Yep. So I, that can also come in your labor advisory board explaining about like, you know, the company and the, it does build exclusivity as well. And uh, especially if it's a McGruff or a will kit, then you're using the whole, this, you have one-time access to the same insurance programs. Uh, and then, but also at the end of it, if they still are wanting to think about it, then what you're going to want to say to them is, I usually will say, so uh, Kathy, usually somebody wants to think about it for one of three reasons, either because I didn't explain the benefits well enough to you. Secondly, they don't apply to you, you don't think. And the last one is affordability. Now, which one of those things applies to you the most, Kathy, in your situation for you and your husband? And then I then can then identify which, like what the actual problem is like does it apply to them and i can then explain how it does apply to them you know based on what i know that they do have or don't have if it is they are i didn't explain it well enough okay then i know to go back and re-explain the program again if it's affordability i can then go back and i can down close right um so that that it's like a report card close is what really that one actually is called so um yeah and i'm asking what those out of those three reasons which one applies to them the most 
um, can usually, if not, uh, and then just kind of going from there, making them feel more sure that they do need this and the uncertainty about the qualifications. I would also throw things in there like, okay, well, based on your family history that you do have with your health and the family with diabetes on your, on your mom's side and your dad's side as well, and your dad's heart problems there too, I would really not want to see you guys come back here, you know, your RCS the next enrollment period and not be able to qualify, period. I would not be able to sleep at night. So with that being said, like, let's see if you guys can even qualify first and foremost, get the application done, the questions all answered. So that's all locked in right now, your health and age is right now. I would suggest you can always upgrade down the road, Kathy. So if you want to start off basic, we can start basic for you guys right now, but you guys definitely are going to need the two hours to make this inflation proof. Okay. Does that make sense? And then I would then just kind of just go right into the questions and uh, from there. And I also avoid sin. And I also avoid asking for social, like, so right away, know, know your questions off the top of your head right away. So you can go into medicals, like right away, you're asking questions about health and then filling it in afterwards, even on your side. But uh, yeah, and leaning on qualifications can really help with that because um, the company's going to want to think about it too. That's the thing is they're going to want to think about it for a while as well. Um, so it's not going to be a choice that's going to be made on either side right away. And hey, Kathy, I don't expect you to make it right away. You, see, you do have time to think about these things while it's all going to be an underwriting. We can, of course, see if you can even qualify. Uh, you want to avoid those ones if you can, uh, you know, try and make it solid. Hopefully after the meeting, meet with them again. Uh, and really try and, you know, actually re-cement that and, and cement that that close, really, and cement that deal and that EAP. But getting them into the EAP is, should be your first step and try and get them into the EAP to even see if they can qualify or ask some medical questions. And, you know, you can tell them based on, you know, what I know and how long I've been here, I'll have a good idea if you guys are going to be a standard application or a trial application. And if you're standard, then we can then cross that bridge explaining how that does work. If you're a trial application, it's no stress on, on you at all for the next like six to eight weeks. Okay. And then I would then go through the questions from there. At least I've then gotten them into the e-app. And then, but it's usually what I find it comes down to if someone's wanting to think about it, it's either a bad buying situation. So like they just don't have the time to get going somewhere else. Or it's just there's just too much going on. They weren't listening the best throughout it or the, or the most they could have or should have. Or secondly, the affordability fact. But if you know it's not affordability, then it's likely not been a good buying situation or just the timing for the day for what they have planned afterwards. Just there isn't enough time for them to actually go through that with that part. So they just say no for convenience sake, even though they do need it. That could happen as well too. But I try and get them into the e-app and just lean on qualifications. And this is why the more you know about their family history, the more I can help you to use that against them. We're not against them, but help them really help push them to do what they need to do for their family, right? Which you know in, the, in, in your heart of hearts is the best thing for them. And if that's what you know, then you can feel good about doing that, right? You don't need to feel bad or, you know, question, am I doing the right thing here? You're like, no, this is what they do need. Like, based on what you guys have told me thus far, I wouldn't feel good about myself leaving this without having that answered for you guys. And you just getting something in place there. For, it's better than nothing, right? And going like that. I would try and lean on qualifications more, though, um, and really exclusivity. This is your enrollment period. Um, you know, so once, you're, once your report card is done, I can't really, you know, take your call to back this in a month from now. Like, that's not something I ever do because those calls never come anyways. So you don't want to be um, having people trying to call you back in a month or two months from now. So I would just do a full takeaway, the full takeaway at that point. And then, you know, but you, like figure out though, I would figure out what, what are those three reasons though, first and foremost. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Maggie. Yeah. So I just have kind of a follow-up question on what we just uh, talked about. Uh, for those clients that they're thinkers and uh, you kind of go through the qualification process and you'll go through the EAP, uh, what is the percentage? And I'm not asking about the actual percent, but if it's high or low uh, of percentage people that let's say they will come back in five days uh, by come back uh, call to cancel uh, what they have already done. Do you come across uh, a lot of percentage that they would do that? Or um, they're, they're so on, low, or I I should not worry about that part. I would say that you want to meet with them again afterwards, because if you don't meet with them again afterwards, and you're just doing the EAP, and they still are, are thinking about it, you haven't done the report. So what I do is I leave the report card for that next meeting, if there is going to be a next meeting. And that way I have something to come back to and why they have to get back on Zoom. 
I have to screen share. I get that commitment from them that yes, we have to come do this afterwards. I can get in trouble if I don't do this part. And that's what I do say. And then with them coming back on, then I know that no, I've had ones where I've had to no production it. Yes. But it's better than me not having even gotten the EF done and actually like try to, or a PSR form and just lowering the coverage to a more comfortable plan um, at that point in time. But I'll usually, it's, I would say it's not that high really when it comes to like direct cancels on that sort of thing, as long as you are meeting with them. But if they do skip that meeting, then yes, they're probably going to just tell them office to cancel their application most likely if you don't meet with them again and follow up with them. And my understanding is you get them to sign uh, the first meeting, not the second one when you do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. sign the first meeting. Yeah, sign the first meeting. Then I hold on to it on my side until the second meeting. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Because it, it is an emotional buy, guys. And people are not going to want to make that same. Like if they just will not, like, nobody will come back on the next time and feel this, feel as powerful uh, or feel as compelled to make that choice or that they do need this as they did the first time, right? Unless you were to go through the whole script again, it's not going to happen. It's an emotional buy. Mm -hmm. So anything else, guys? I have one more question. I'm not 100% sure if it 100% fits in this, this conversation, but I think I think you'd be the right person to ask. What do you do with people you sell who call back and say, you know, maybe six months later, a year later, I need to cancel my policy. I can't afford it anymore. What do you do then? You, of course, would then strip down to the basics so they don't lose what they put into the program, uh, first and foremost, and just explaining to them that, like, this is, like, I really, at that point, to that person, it's, it, it's likely a bill. So you need yeah. to get them out of that mindset of it being a bill, and that this is them having a guaranteed amount of money in the bank when something happens that's tax deferred, that's going to be there immediately, as opposed to them having to go through all these things and putting them through all these different things to try and get that money, which they are going to be able to do, right? So who's got that kind of cash in the bank? Generally speaking, not many folks, right? So, um, but I would just strip it down to a more basic program, PSR form down and reduce the policy. Um, and really, but you have to get them to understand that this is not a bill. And in way, but in like until that's done, they're likely going to still want to still just cancel the policy. Right. Uh, until they do understand this is not a bill. This is their future. This is you having a guaranteed amount that you're putting towards each month that if you pass it between now and then you have that there. Right. And this is tax deferred as well. So it's it's not it's one of those things that, yes, like you could easily just like lower it. But most times you can usually get them to keep the coverage they have, and if not even like it so much, they want to add to it. If you re-explain it again, people forget sometimes, have them come back on, re-explain their program to them. And then usually once they understand it a bit better, how it does work, because it is a lot to take in in one meeting, right? Mm -hmm. It's a lot of information to take in in one meeting. So you following up with them as well afterwards is going to cement that too. I usually would do six months after a sale, I'll follow up with the client and talk to them. I find that it's helping with both of our attention quite significantly. Let's keep them on the books. But yeah, that's just something that I would do because if, they, if they're calling it a bill and they're thinking of it as, oh, I have to cut this bill, uh, my life insurance should be the last one you want to cut, really. Your internet should go first. Your phone bill should go first, like, to be honest. Unless you're on like a really high, high, high life insurance plan, yes, reduce the policy down. If it is a really big program and there are extras in there, then yes, very down the very much of a basic program. And then when these are better financially for you guys, we get you back up to where you guys were before. Okay. And but explain to them how they will, you know, have to re-qualify again, of course, is super important too. Um, and as long as they understand that part and that they may not be able to qualify again for this again, and don't get mad at me if that's the case, kind of thing. Uh, I've said that line as well. Um, and it's usually stopped them from even wanting to do it at all, period. They said, you sure you know what? We can make it work. We can make it work, usually. But I mean. It's situational as well. Definitely it comes down to each person. And usually you can bring it down to a basic program of what is comfortable or what's actually needed, right? But like I said, usually you want to have them come back onto Zoom, explain the program face-to-face -to, -face to them again so they actually know what it is that they're actually putting their money towards. Otherwise, they're not going to understand it. They're not going to remember the meeting they had with you six months earlier to know uh, it's growing, you know, cash value as well that they can use while they're still alive. That, like how much is actually there for them? All they know is they have life insurance. They don't know what it's for, how it works, how it pays out, the differences between this and other insurance policies out there. So there's a lot that's different that we have that others don't have and that we can't offer. If they're a trial or if they were a trial, that's an easy save because, I mean, good luck getting coverage elsewhere, right? So, um, but yeah, 
And Sean, what are you saying there? I had a referral who was excited to enroll after their mom enrolled that had some life events. Sean, sorry, you can, what was your question, Sean? Yeah, I was just saying uh, I had a referral who was, uh, I sat with the, the mom and the daughter and she was, she was like, hey, uh, can I actually get this insurance too? And she was all excited to get it. Um, she, I guess she had some life circumstances happen and then um, sent me a message saying that, you know, hey, Sean, all the calls and messages are getting overwhelming. Uh, can you take me off the contact list? Um, but her mom still has coverage. And I tried to explain like, Hey, this is going to be a hit on your, on your MIB file. Like how, how would you approach that situation? Um, if it's similar to what I'm like, how I'm hearing what you said. So I had one recently that the lady was quite uncomfortable, about the phone calls she was getting from UW, I'm not sure it was likely just a couple of phone calls at bad times for putting kids to bed. Likely I'm assuming it was, but I just, I just told her that, Hey, no worries. But I'll do is I'll tell underwriting just to get in touch with me and then I'll call you and then I'll three-way you into home office for you and then talk to you. Okay. That way they're not calling you directly at bad times. Um, mm -hmm. And from there that stopped it. But do you mean calls from you or calls from home office and underwriting? Well, it, it was both. It, it was, uh, because I was trying to get the underwriting requirements done in time. Uh, it actually was withdrawn on application. So I, I was like, hey, we can bring it down. And she was like, yeah, I can, uh, if it's closer to $100 a month, I can do it. So I reopened it for the $100 a month. And then I checked um, I checked the account there and it showed first reopen uh, withdrawn. And then I contacted her and she was like, yeah, the calls and messages were getting overwhelmed. Uh, I canceled my policy. Take me off the contact. Take me off your, uh, put me on your do not call list. Okay. Yeah, I can, I mean, I could do a whole thing on, on, con like, on conserving business in that aspect. Um, that's a totally, I guess, different topic mm -hmm. than, um, but it would have been through, like, I guess it comes down to like, really like, I mean, in the meeting, was she just, oh, I want it too. Or was she actually there the whole meeting to listen to it all? Right. Like, I don't know. Yeah, she was. That's she was there the whole meeting and then uh, I, I enrolled the mom and then she actually asked me, hey, can I get this insurance too? Um, is this yeah. something that I can get? And then and then, yeah, she was like super nice. It was super solid rapport. Um, I like she answered the phone for when I needed to do the underwriting requirements, the very first part. And then it was shortly after that that she messaged and was like, yeah, my boyfriend and I broke up. Uh, uh, I told underwriting that I need to put a hold on it for a couple of months. And then that's when I told her, hey, we can reduce it. No problem. Um, yeah, Sean, I can come over to your after and talk to you and tell yeah. you exactly what I would do with that one in particular. Uh, I still want to, everybody else yeah, to yeah. Get that part about it. But yeah, I can tell you exactly how to handle that one there. But that one as well could have been as well, though, just uh, them not knowing to call you first, I guess, and knowing that home office doesn't handle those certain things themselves. They don't work in sure. the enrollment department. Um, so that's something that they should be calling you for, not home office. And just having yeah. that trust and that, like, I mean, I guess that commitment from the sit, like at the warm down of your meeting, getting them to commit that they're going to be contacting you and not home office for things. Cause home office is a call center environment. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, and they're not going to be able to answer or handle certain things for you. Like I'd be able to handle for you. So as long as I know I'm in the loop, I actually get help. Otherwise how much I can do to help you. Right. At that point, you're getting that commitment from them, getting them put your, your like your number as well. Then you get their number, save them in your phone, same time, getting them like a proper warm down. Warm downs are extremely important to like cementing your sales. So that way you don't have somebody calling home office, you know, and canceling a policy that, you know, they should have called you about and you could have been able to problem solve with them, right? Yeah. People don't realize yeah. what, what their options are. I think it's either they keep it all or they cancel it. That's what they think. So mm -hmm. they don't know how whole life insurance works. So they just cancel it after paying into it, you know. So whenever I see a client who's paid into a policy for three years and wants to cancel, they don't understand their policy enough. That's what that really tells me because nobody would want to do that. They want to reduce it. They wouldn't want to cancel it. So for sure. that means that they had to get on a call with me. I got to re-explain to them, resell them on the program again in some cases, um, and or at least on the product itself and how it does work. And at that point, then figure out what the best course of action is moving forward. Sometimes it's keep it the exact same. Now they actually understand what they have and they're paying for. Okay, no worries. Sometimes it's put it in half. Sometimes it's down to a dollar a day, like whatever it may be, right? But mm -hmm. shouldn't have them calling home office directly on you. 
if they are respecting you enough. And I mean, come to me with any of your problems, whatever time of day or night it is, just text me. I'll be able to get back to you within 24 hours. As long as you do the same for me, is that fair? That commitment there is really important as well. I get all those as well at the end of my meetings. So, but yeah, that I think that's one that I can come and help you with in particular to save that one. But yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else, guys? The questions about like rejections in general, like how to paint that picture for somebody, how to properly like get your scripts memorized and make sure that you guys are all able to focus on not just what you're saying, but how you're saying your, your script and using like your nonverbal communication as well to the use your hands. Awesome, guys. Thanks. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. And hey, guys, with that being said, you guys know what to do now. If you don't know your scripts, get your scripts memorized. It's honestly the most important thing that I think has propelled me anyways with my activity and my ALP. So get those scripts down, Pat, as fast as you can. Practice some video off presentations. Focus on you know your tonality and what you're saying um, and how you're saying it and stuff as opposed to you know being um, anxious on the screen, which can help when you're brand new. I would suggest it if you're new, start video off. And that way you can just focus on what you're saying. And then get your scripts memorized, guys. And let's go have an awesome week. It's uh, only the 16th. So lots of months left to go. See so you all can get to 10K uh, and up for this month. Ayo, let's get it.